Good evening. Thank you for joining Brushy Mountain Bee Farm's webinar. My name is Daniel Roth. I am the graphic designer for Brushy Mountain Bee Farm, and I would like to welcome you along with Karen Rennick and Dennis Van Engelsdorp, who will be discussing Bee Informed Partnerships National Management Survey results. I'm going to post a, a question out there for everybody just to see how many people have actually heard of Bee Informed Partnership. So if you will kind of answer that question for me, I'd greatly appreciate it. So you can see here that the bowl 65, 69. Okay, thank you for answering that. I'm going to close the polls now. And it looks like a good number of you have heard of Be Informed Partnership, which is great because you know, it's a, a, a great program that's running right now. Um, today with us we have Karen Rennick and Den uh, Dennis Van Engelsdort. Um, Karen is actually based out of the University of Maryland's entomology department, and she is the project manager for the Be Informed Partnership. Uh, she works closely with the, the data analysis, writes many of BIPs, um, informative blogs, and even goes out into the field on some occasions. She has been a part-time, um, sorry, she has been a part of BIP from the beginning and has done, and still does, an outstanding job in moving this project forward in the right direction. Dennis is the assistant research scientist at the University of Maryland's entomology department. He is one of the leading researchers in our industry, and his astounding research will hopefully lead to understanding and improving honeybee health. You may have read some of his publications or had the privilege of listening to one of his talks. I am very excited to have both of you here with me, and on behalf of Brushy Mountain Bee Farm and our listening audience, thank you for joining us. With that said, um, I, I did want to run a, another quick poll to see how many of our listening audience participated in the National Management Survey from the previous year. So if you will please answer that question for me just so we can get a, a better understanding of this. So it looks like we're about 50-50 on, on those who've taken it and those who haven't. Um, so Dennis and Karen, if, if I don't know if you want to take a moment to kind of explain it a little bit better so people have a better understanding of what the, the survey does. Um, and then if you'll actually, I guess while we, we brought you here today, uh, if you'll just explain the results um, that the survey produces, um, and the benefits of these results. So with that said, um, I open up the mic to, to Karen and Dennis. Okay, thank you, Daniel. This is Karen Rennick, uh, and, and Dennis Van Engelsdorp is sitting right beside me. Uh, thanks for giving those polls. Uh, hopefully, the 50% that did not take the management survey, maybe after the end of the talk, you'll be convinced that there is, there is great value in it, and hopefully you will learn something and want to contribute next year. Uh, anytime you want to, you can go to our website and sign up to participate in next year's survey. So our surveys go live in April. It's usually April 1st. You can actually go to our website anytime between now and then and sign up and your email address will be added to our listserv. So you'll get an automatic reminder April 1st to, uh, to be asked to take the management survey and what we call the annual loss survey that precedes it. So with that, let's get started. Um, to give you a little bit of background, we're not going to go into to a lot of detail on, on the formation of BIP, but it was started as a five-year, uh, it was a competitive grant um, awarded by USDA NIFA. And NIFA is the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. It's an arm of the USDA. And this grant was awarded in 2011, so we're about halfway through our fourth year, and it's a five-year grant. Um, it, it is a grant. Uh, uh, given to the University of Maryland. However, we do work with other institutions and universities across the country. There are eight other universities we work with. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have a lot of the leading uh, 
honeybee scientists on our project as well as uh, epidemiologists from, from cancer health and so forth. Uh, we have economics from University of Illinois. So there's a, there's a great broad scope of knowledge that we have uh, folded into the, the BNFOR partnership. So what we're doing is we're using real world, real world uh, management practices to try to see if we can reduce mortality of honeybee colonies across the country. And we gather most of that data from our management surveys in April. Uh, there are many arms of the Bee Informed Partnership. For this presentation, we're going to limit it only to, to the management survey. Uh, so this, this is uh, information we gather from beekeepers across the country. There also are arms of the Bee Informed Partnership where we are actually gathering um, longitudinal and real data in the field from commercial uh, beekeepers across the country. We reach uh, the queen breeders through honey producers, through migratory beekeepers. So um, if you can go to our website and read more about our other uh, services we provide. But for this one, we're going to keep, try to keep this, the scope small and focus only on the management survey. Hi, Karen. Thanks for, for that introduction. And thanks, Daniel and, and Brushy Mountain Farm, Shane Gebauer, for giving us the opportunity to do this. Um, just, just I want to I want to go back a little bit in time and give a little bit of history here, and and that was well before BIP was formed. At that time, I was the state apiarist in Pennsylvania, and that's when the first cases of colony collapse disorder emerged. And so we started doing what's now known as the winter loss survey, and so you can see we've been doing that over eight years, and you can see those results we, that was done with the Apiary Inspectors of America originally, and now it's done through the Bee Informed Partnership, and what you can see is these red lines are the total loss experienced of colonies in the country. And you can see that on average, over the last eight years, it's just about 30% mortality. You can see there's a little bit of a cyclical nature to the loss, to the loss rate. Last year was a little bit better than, than previous years, um, with the exception of 2011, 2012. So there's some variability, but still well above 20%. And as I said, averaging just around 30%. Now these blue lines are when we ask beekeepers, what type of loss do you think are acceptable? And you can see that by and large, that's around 15%. And so on average, we're losing twice as many colonies as beekeepers think are acceptable. Now, of course, these are averages. But if we look at that data a little bit more, what we find are that the 25% of beekeepers who lose, who lose the fewest amount of colonies lose on average 10% of their colonies. Whereas the top losers, the top 25% of beekeepers, who lose more than 50% of it, lose 50% of their colonies. So even though that average is 30, we have this huge range. We have some beekeepers who lose very few colonies and some beekeepers who lose a lot of colonies. And so this begs the question, is there some difference between the group that doesn't lose many colonies and the group that loses a lot of colonies? So of course, that's where this idea came from to do management surveys and a lot of these other survey works we'll touch on a little bit more later on in order to try to figure out those differences. We want to share some of those differences in a minute that we've, we've noticed. In order to do that, what we've basically done is we've used epidemiological tools to do this. So people studying human health have realized that human health is very complex. There's a lot of different factors involved. And just like any beekeeper can tell you, there's a lot of factors involved in bee health. And so what we want to do is take a lot of in-field data and put it into a database, get real-time analysis done, and get that back to both the beekeepers so they can make informed decisions, and also to policymakers so they can make wise database policy decisions. And then, of course, collect the field data again and keep that cycle going. So that, in a nutshell, is what we're doing. We're developing a really big national honeybee health database so that we can use epidemiological tools to tease out ways that, that, that demonstrate what's killing colonies, but also ways in which beekeepers can help keep colonies alive. Now, there's a couple of things I want to be really clear about as we present the data today. The first thing is, is that correlation is not the same as causation. This is really important. So we're going to be showing you a lot of correlative data, and that can't mean causation. So for instance, one of the strongest correlative values for 
the number of colonies in the country is actually the divorce rate in South Carolina. So if you were to believe that correlation equals causation, you would say we should just invest in a lot of marriage counselors in South Carolina. And anyone, everyone who's listening, I hope, realizes that would be ridiculous because this just so happens to be correlated. There's nothing to believe that there is a relationship between these two trends. And so we're going to further, further uh, go on that example of, of correlation does not imply causation because this is a very important fact to get across. We're going to be showing you data that is, is truly correlative. We haven't done the research then to link why the causes that we're sh the, the, the causes the mortality that we're showing is caused by the management action, but it strongly suggests that there is a correlation. So, for an example, in the 2011 issue of Causation Correlation uh, Journal, the scientists found that when ice cream consumption increases, so do shark attacks. So this would this would ask the question: Does the increase in ice cream sales cause the shark attacks because the ice cream makes people tastier, or both peaks actually occur in the summer. So that's a very strong correlation, but obviously, again, not one that's, that, that makes a lot of common sense. So uh, those are two examples that we hope you'll, you'll keep in the back of your mind as we show you this data. To go over what we have as far as the representation of colonies in the United States, what we're going to show you here is the 2013-2014 results that just were posted on our website about two weeks ago. And to give you an idea of how many colonies we are representing in, in the United States, for this past year's management survey, we reached over, over a million or a half a million managed colonies in the United States. Based on the data that we get from the, uh, from the agricultural uh, census uh, accounting firm, that's around 21 to 22 percent of the country's estimated 2.6 million colonies. And then what we have there is listed the previous year's surveys and how many colonies were reached by those surveys. So we're, we're, in the last two years, we've been reaching over a quarter of the colonies in the United States. So we're reaching a very, uh, I think, representative uh, population of the colonies that are alive in the United States. So another thing, all the reports that we're going to show you in this presentation and all the previous year's reports are available and, and, and viewable on our website. So one of the first questions we asked in the management survey is we, we try to define our stakeholders. And these are the, obviously the, the small beekeepers, what we would call the backyard beekeepers, the medium beekeepers or sideliners, and then the commercial beekeepers. Um, for this data that we have from a, a document in 2009, uh, the small beekeepers defined as those people who have fewer than 25 colonies, whereas the, the, the uh, sideliners would have 25 to 1,000 colonies, and then commercial beekeepers with more than 1,000 colonies. So you can quickly see from the numbers that are presented here, the, the vast majority of beekeepers in the United States, that being the backyard beekeepers, only manage about 2% of U.S. colonies whereas the very small number of beekeepers, that being the commercial beekeepers at 4% of the population, manage 70% of the colonies. And we think that this estimate is actually low, that actually we think that maybe 2 or 3% of beekeepers manage more than 90% of colonies. So if we look at the results by operation size, uh, here you can see them broken out by the backyard sideline and commercial beekeepers, uh, that the commercial beekeepers lose much, much fewer colonies than those of the, of the sideline or in the backyard beekeeper. And when you look at these slides, you'll also see if there's a, an asterisk by the title, that there's a note at the bottom. And we've gone back through our survey and found those reports where we've seen three or more consecutive years where this result held true. So in this case, for three consecutive years, the commercial beekeepers were losing far, far fewer colonies than, than the sideline or backyard beekeepers. Now, if we look at the loss by operation type, we've segregated the, the operation by those who move their colonies across state. So this would be migratory beekeepers and those who are stationary or non-migratory beekeepers. So here again, you can see the migratory beekeepers, the loss last year was around 30%, while those with stationary colonies had about a loss of 45%, a, a very significant difference. And again, you can see the asterisk where this holds true for three consecutive years where the migratory beekeepers are losing much, much less than the backyard beekeeper, or the starting the stationary beekeepers. 
So Karen, if I can just add quickly, I think that this, it, what this does is it it, 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 it it shows two things. First of all, a lot of people will say, oh, isn't it because of the migratory nature of American beekeeping that we're losing so many colonies? This correlation does not suggest that that is true. Um, and so, but what it doesn't tell us is why this difference exists. And so it could be that there is, in fact, something intrinsic about moving your colonies that keeps them alive. That's a little bit difficult to imagine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't true. Or it could be that the migratory beekeepers are the ones making a livelihood of keeping bees, and so are much more aggressive about making sure their colonies stay alive. And so again, you can't say causation, but this correlation does suggest that there's something different between these two populations. Okay, now it, it, it's obvious when we look at the data that there is, is, a, is a big difference between regional uh, practices. And not only that, there's a big difference in losses between regions. So if we just easily divide the country into the north and the south, you can see that, and, and it may come to no one who, uh, not a surprise to anybody who keeps bees in the north, that northern beekeepers lose many more colonies than beekeepers in the south. In fact, this was one of the few findings we have where we have all four years of this management survey that supports that. So in the previous year that we just did the survey, there was a 33% difference in mortality rate if you kept bees in the north than if you keep bees in the south. And we're going to go into those regional differences in a little bit more detail later on. So if we further break the beekeepers up by subregions here, you can see that beekeepers, again, in the south, southeast and southwest, consistently lost fewer colonies than those beekeepers in the north or the midwest. Okay, so if you, if you want to explore a little bit more of the regional management practices, we don't know who's on the line from what region. We have broken it out on our website. If you can see where this red arrow is pointing, if you go to beinformed.org and you click on re research and then re uh, regional results, it'll take you to a map where we've broken out the United States into several regions. You can look for your state and click on your state and it will give you the, the specific regional results for that area. We always suggest that if a state has more than 300 respondents in our, in our management survey, we will break that state out specifically and give you your own management results. And that occurred uh, for two states last year, who I believe was, I'm trying to remember now who it was. I think it was North Carolina, Carolina and Virginia. No, North Carolina and Virginia. So those states would have their own management results. They would also be grouped in the region where they fall as well. So you can go to the website and see those regional results, because there are some differences, uh, obviously, in management techniques and mortality between those regions. And so if you click on one of those regions, what you'll see is this report that gives all the significant differences. And so now we're just, we'll move into um, talking about what some of those differences are. We're looking at each other because we're not sure it's <laughs> supposed to be talking about. One of the most, so I want to just emphasize that then. So these are national results. What we realize is that beekeeping requires a lot of different management techniques at the same time. But because we have so much dirty data, we need a lot of data to come up with management, like correlative stuff, so we can do all these practices combined. So what we're presenting here is a monofactorial, just one thing at a time. We're just about, we have a great PhD student who's working on doing all the, all the practices combined. What are the most, all, if you do, if you feed and you treat for rural mite, what does that mean? So let's just go through these monofactorial results. One of the most consistent findings we find are that people who treat for varroa mite with a known varroa mite product lose significantly fewer colonies than those who don't. What is astonishing to me is that 58% of beekeepers aren't treating for varroa mite. I think this is irresponsible, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on with the, the data we have. I think that by not treating, you're basically spreading your mite problem to your neighbors who may be treating. And, and, and I understand why some people do this, but I think it's negligent. It's also, even though this, this result is very stark and clear, if we look at the different products that can be used, it's clear that some products no longer work. If you look at um, Kumaphos, for instance, 
people who used it did not lose significantly more or less than people who didn't treat with anything at all. Um, we see that Amitraz, Apigard, and Apolifar, these products, and these products consistently over survey years have shown to work, that they reduce the people who use these products, lose fewer colleagues than those who didn't. Um, formic acid and flavalinate, um, 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 no, sorry, formic acid and oxalic acid for three consecutive years have been shown to work. Amitraz is a really effective product. Flavalinate only one year did we so, so that it reduced losses, and that's probably because we have resistant mites. I think the take-home message here is if you're a beekeeper, use Apigard, Apolifar, Amitraz if you're comfortable using a hard chemical, or formic acid. These products have been shown to consistently work over time. These are also not, except for Amitraz, these are not products that are going to build up in your wax, so you don't have to be worried about long-term contamination. Okay, one of the other questions we asked in the management survey is how did you start or obtain new colonies? So some of the several ways you can obtain new colonies are, are buying colonies, existing hives, installing swarms, packages, or splitting. And we found last year that if you split a colony, I think it wasn't, no, it wasn't installed swarm this year. Splitting a colony, uh, if you managed to split any of your colonies last year, that showed that you were far less likely to lose colonies than if you, say, bought a package. So we don't understand what, well, the splitting may be because you're breaking the brood cycle for the varroa. The packages, we're not quite sure we understand. Um, but Other again, of course, packages require a lot of energy to start building up. Right. So it's it's a lot of work to get those strong enough to survive. Yeah, and this, this is one, one report where we haven't seen consistent data. So we're looking for another year of data to see where this, this might lead us. Because we have actually seen um, installation of swarms as, as being lower losses as well. Okay, did you replace your queens? I know this is a controversial subject. Some beekeepers will not replace their queens. They'll let the, the colony decide it, and, and they will supersede on their own. So when we ask the question, did you or did you not replace the queens, those people who did replace their queens in the year of the survey lost fewer colonies than those people who did not replace their queens. If you look at beekeepers who only maintain or manage a single stock of honeybee queens, you can see that those who maintain purely only Italian colonies lost more colonies than those who did not use purely Italian uh, queens. If you choose, this is, this is also the, the opposite is true of locally selected, which I think is a boon to a lot of local bee clubs that are trying to raise local, their own local stock, that those people who did choose to use purely local stock lost fewer counties than those who did not. So of course there are other techniques to control varroa mites. Um, one of those is drone brood removal. And so drone brood removal is where you add a frame of drone brood, uh, drone foundation, the bees rear drone, and you come and you remove it. Now, if you look at this data, you can see this is the national data, and this has been pretty consistent. There's no difference between people who use that technique and people who did not use that technique. However, if we break it down by region, what you can see is multi-regional or migratory beekeepers. You can see these really big confidence intervals. That basically means that there weren't very many respondents, and so it's a very large confidence interval. Here you can see those confidence intervals do not overlap, and so there was a big difference. And we can see that consistently people who practice drone brood removal in the north lost fewer colonies than those who didn't. In the south, the confidence intervals don't overlap, uh, or do overlap, and so there's no difference. Now, drone brood removal works because what we know is that Varroa might prefer drone brood as the reproductive place. So they'll move into that larval drone brood and reproduce there. And because drones which take longer to mature compared to worker larvae, the Varroa have more children than they would otherwise. And so there's a big advantage for Varroa to select a drone brood to reproduce in compared to brood, worker brood. And that, of course, is because of the length of time that they're an adult. So a varroa infesting a worker brood will, on average, have 1.3 to 1.4 kids. A drone will have between 2.2 and 2.6 kids. Queens re develop so quickly that even if it is invaded with a varroa, there are no viable children. Now, one of the reasons varroa, drone brood removal doesn't work very well 
or a lot of people practice it, is because it's a lot of work to remove honey supers. And so one technique that, may, that we've shown can work to help solve this problem is this tower system, where you can have these two brood chambers side by side, both containing a queen. There being a queen excluder right over here between the two brood chambers and your honey supers here. That way you can lift up your lid and you always have access to that drone frame to remove it um, as part of that management system. Of course, you have to remove it at least once every 24 days. If you wait longer, suddenly all that drone starts hatching out and you have a bigger problem than you did in the beginning. Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, small hive beetle traps. Small hive beetle is, is, a, is a horrible problem in some areas of the United States and, and, and less so in others. Uh, however, we do ask if, if beekeepers manage for that, and one way of doing that is, is either using a trap at the bottom of the colony or, or in-frame traps. Uh, that's very common uh, to use right where the brood is. This shows, and this is again three non-consecutive years, but three out of the four years where beekeepers who employed small hive beetle traps lost significantly fewer colonies than those who did not. So these are people who are employing small hive beetle traps even through the winter. And uh, this, I think, is a fascinating finding, one that was completely unexpected, I think, by us because we hadn't thought the, the mechanics through. Yeah. That, well, know. and it's true. When I first saw this, the first year data, I just thought it was just a fluke. But it's hard to argue with three or four years data. So we have to try to figure out what's the mechanism there. Maybe those small hive beetle disturb the winter cluster and, and make the bees eat more honey. and so. They have problems, so there's a lot of theoretical reasons we can explain, um, but it's it's quite a stark finding and a yeah. surprising one. And a surprising and fascinating one. Okay, then we go to if uh, this is another regional result that had significant uh, a significant difference is that we've asked if you employ screen bottom boards. We also ask if you how how many months of the year you employ the screen bottom boards, but this is specifically broken out by region. So this is if you use screen bottoms at any point in in your yearly management technique. And you can see that, yes, indeed, if you use them in the north, that you lost far fewer colonies than if you did not use screen bottom boards. And there's good science behind this. Um, there have been studies where they do do these mites. And the theory is, is that mites will often fall off the bees and fall on the bottom board. And if you have a solid bottom board, they just jump on the bee. But if they fall through that screen and onto another bottom board, onto the dirt, that means they're removed from the system and they die there. And so having just this slow level of loss. We don't think just using screen bottom boards on their own is going to negate the need to treat for Varroa, but it clearly has some positive impact. Yeah, and it may be related to that we do have a, a cold cycle in the north that allows that drop and, and removal to happen, whereas in the south they may not have that break in the brood cycle. Okay, this, this was another startling finding, uh, the carbohydrate feed by source. Then we ask you, do you feed your colonies? So that's, that's one question, yes or no. But then we go dig a little deeper and we say, how do you feed your colonies? Or what do you feed your colonies um, through the winter or even in, in periods of dearth? And this was, a, 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 again, another startling finding, just like the small hive beetle, is that we show every year of the survey that those beekeepers who fed frames of honey to their, to their colonies lost significantly more, more colonies than those people who didn't. In fact, you can see the difference here if you fed dry sugar or I, be, I believe candy board, which I think some of you call it uh, fondant, you actually lost fewer colonies than if you fed frames of honey. So it's a very interesting finding. And we're seeing actually that um, the candy board has actually, I think, had about two years of data where it's consistently shown that. But there's something un behind the frames of honey, why feeding frames of honey would cause higher losses uh, we don't know yet. Right. And it also could be, again, not a causation thing. It could be that the people who are losing a lot of colonies just have a lot of frames of honey yeah. around <laughs> to feed. So it could have nothing to do with the frames of honey. Or it could be that there are some viral or disease loads that are occurring those frames of honey causing the loss. I think more informative is that if you were to ask me what to feed colonies, I would be feeding them candy boards or fondant and dry sugar. They seem to have a benefit. Uh, high fructose corn syrup, no evidence that it's bad for the bees. Same with sugar syrup. Okay, so on the on the flip side, now we've covered carbohydrates, we'll look at the protein feed. And so these are any any protein feed. This is a commercial protein feed, a homemade for, uh, protein feed, 
But this year, uh, which I think was one of the few years that showed a benefit that if you did feed protein to your to your colonies, you lost significantly fewer colonies than if you did not. Uh, this this may be a yearly result. Um, when we see changes from year to year, depending on uh, what what the weather was like, this may be just a, a an anomalous result. We, we may see this from from the year uh, to continue, depending on the region too. The other, the other really surprising uh, results we found have to do with frame management. So when you're a beekeeper, you're going to come across dead colonies. And you have two choices when you come across a dead colony. You can either decide to bring the equipment home with you and store it and use it later on, or you can decide to reuse that comb right away. So if we look at the treatment of dead out equipment, what you can see, and this really surprised me, and again, it's now three years of data, so we can't ignore it, that the people who immediately reused equipment lost significantly fewer colonies than those who stored equipment. And, and, and I, I, I really have a hard time understanding this data. But in talking with commercial beekeepers, they all tend to agree that this is the truth. If you continuously reuse the bees that are, are the comb that is put on colonies tends to support healthier colonies than comb that had been stored for a period of time. Now, again, this is again difference. Did you use old brood comb? Did you reuse it in, a, in your colonies? So this is comb that had been stored. And so what you can see are the people who used brood comb, old brood comb, did much better than those who did not use brood comb. So perhaps used foundation or something else. And so again, pointing to the fact that there is, seems to be some advantage to using older comb and not just having new comb. Again, a little bit difficult to understand, but again, pointing. So we ask another question, which seems to point to exactly the same thing. Of course, we talked about comb replacement in the brood chamber for a long time. And people have argued, you know, you should replace your comb regularly. Well, here you see, this is the blue line, these are people who did not replace any of their frames in the brood nest. And here are people who replaced more than 50% of the comb. And what you can see is there's a trend and then a significant difference between those who use 50 replace 50% and those who didn't lose any, replace anything at all. Again, all this pointing to the fact that there may be some benefit with this older comb. And while I certainly think that we need to be calling some of our comb and replacing some of that older comb, I think we shouldn't be doing it very aggressively. There was a time that I would have advised you to replace all your comb once every two years. This data suggests that, that was very bad advice, which I wonder whether <laughs> you should ever listen to anything I have to say. But, um, 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 but I think it does point to the fact that there can be too much of a good thing. There's something really beneficial about that old comb, and that's certainly worth further investigation. And using, I think using, um, Using all new comb may be putting stress on the colonies where they're using you know much needed resources to build a new comb when they could be using it for other things. Yeah, or is there like beneficial biome in yeah. there, or is there propolis there? We know propolis stimulates the immune system. Right. So there's a whole bunch of really interesting hypotheses about what drives that difference. I think you're going to talk about some of the other things we do. Yeah. So so that was the Be Informed Partnership Management Survey. We also provide other. Um, services that give you real data about your colonies. Uh, one of those is a longitud longitudinal real-time disease load monitoring. So this is a project that we piloted last year for the first year, and we have about 60 to, 60 to 80 beekeepers doing it this year, where we provide you with a kit uh, for six months, so, that, so to during the beekeeping calendar year, where you start taking samples from your actual colonies. And we have it both for larger beekeepers who sample eight colonies, uh, we've also been, um, um, I guess, fortunate enough to have EAS sponsor a smaller um, sampling program for uh, backyard beekeepers where they sample four colonies a month. So every month you'll go out to your colonies and sample your bees, send them, and these are the same eight colonies every month, send the samples to, to us here in Maryland, and usually within two weeks we'll turn around a report that gives you your actual varroa mite and your nosema spore load um, counts. So not only do you get what you've been also sampled for your 
Okay, you want to talk? Okay. Or do you want? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so these are the sort of reports you get, and I think this is. I want to go back to this report because I think it shows something really important. So in these graphs, what you get is this yellow line is your results. Orange line are the results of everyone else who has participated in that survey that month. And then the gray results are all the results we've ever got for June from any previous year. So from our National Honeybee Disease Survey, from our Tech Transfer Team. So this often represents hundreds, if not thousands, of results. So here, let's look at this one beekeeper. He had really low levels in June. He's really happy, well below half the level, average level. In July, it's exactly the same. August, he's still half the rate of the national average. September, he's well below. Now, September is usually the time you treat. But this guy decided not to treat because he said, heck, my levels are, are half of what the national average is. Then look at what happened in October and November. Really skyrocket. Now, generally, a lot of beekeepers would look at this number, not treat, and if their colonies died, they wouldn't blame Varroa because they don't look at their colony mite levels in October or November. But clearly, these colonies, they're going to die, and they're going to die from Varroa. So what happened here? Well, one thing is, is that as the brood area collapses, there's going to be more mites on the adult bees. So you're going to have an uptick in the number of mites per 100. But also, we think what happens is your neighbors, who have had high mite levels, and their colonies start to crash, the bees go in and rob those colonies, pick up those mites, and bring them home. And so this is why I think it's really nearly unethical for beekeepers not to have a treatment plan in place to control varroa. Now, I totally understand that some beekeepers are saying, well, I don't want to treat because I want to breed from survivor stock. Well, if you want to do that, I think that's very noble, and I encourage you to do so. But the responsible way of doing that is to sample all your colonies in September, find the colonies that have the lowest levels of mites, treat everything, but then breed from those colonies that had the lowest level of mites. I don't think it's reasonable to expect that we will be ever able to breed a resistant stock that could resist the mite load pressure that comes from neighbors invading your colonies. So you, I don't think it's a good technique to do unless you live in complete isolation. So live at least three miles away from any other beekeeper. The other value that beekeepers get from, these, from this service is when, when a beekeeper samples his colony, finds that he needs a treat for Varroa, and he treats for Varroa, very often that beekeeper will not go in and treat or, or, or follow up and monitor the next month. So he or she does not know if that treatment strategy worked. By having a sample, we go all the way out to November. Um, a lot of the beekeepers get the results back after they treated, realize the treatment strategy that they used, either maybe they treated on a temperature-dependent product and, and the temperature range wasn't in the right, right area. They found that, oh my gosh, you know, my, my mites are still high. I need to consider retreating or a different strategy. So by able to monitor your, your colonies on a month-by-month -month basis, it really lets you know what your management strategy is, whether they're working or not. So another product that we have that's really picking up in popularity, especially around this time of year, are what we call the emergency response kits. Uh, we'll get a call from a beekeeper. Uh, who's out in their colonies and all of a sudden they just see that it's either one or more of their colonies are going downhill quickly. They don't have a, a, a really reasonable idea of why that's occurring. They call us. We will FedEx overnight emergency response kits to the beekeeper. When this includes, a, a, we ask them to go sample eight, a composite sample of eight healthy colonies and then a composite sample of what they call a crashing or sick uh, colonies. We, when we get those back into the lab, it takes precedence over all our other samples. We turn that usually the results around within one or two days, call the beekeeper back, let them know the results of the Nozema Varroa. There's also a live bee box that's sent to North Carolina State. They do a full viral analysis on it. There's an option to do pesticide sampling if, you, if you're, uh, um, you're concerned or think that pesticides may be involved. Uh, that adds a little bit to the cost. Um, so this is, this is a product that's designed to kind of rule out obvious, obvious causes of crashes. Um, it's about $80 for the kit. You can go to the website and get a little bit more information. We give you the sampling protocol on the website. Um, these have been very popular. A lot of the times we'll even call the beekeeper and, and talk them through if they were near um, any you know, big ag where they were spraying. Uh, we talked about their management strategies. Did they treat for Varroa? When did they treat? What did they treat with? 
Um, do they feed? When do they feed? What do they feed? Uh, that includes carbohydrates and proteins. So we go through a, a pretty rigorous management survey with them uh, and provide back those results to them. So one of the projects that we're just about to launch is the Sentinel High project. The Sentinel, we're going to pilot this in Maryland, although other B groups around the country are welcome to participate. Basically, very, we've done this fu crowdsourcing funding effort at the University of Maryland. Um, you can look at that if you like. And basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that this project works before really pushing it nationally. But we're trying to combine the strengths of a lot of our different activities and putting it in one package, which is the Sentinel Hive or the Sentinel Apri package. Um, what this means is that we do our, our monitoring, our monthly monitoring. So we're encouraging a B group to get a communal Apri. We do our monthly Varroa and Nosema monitoring, and then they can look at that data online. We also have hive scales, so they can look at their nectar flow and look at their honey production in real time. And then what we're going to do is take all that data and develop algorithms so that we can give alerts on management practices. So if we see honey production is going really quickly, we can say we think swarm time is coming, make sure you're supering your boxes. If we see honey, the, the, the weight gets really low, we can recommend feeding. As we see varroa and nosema levels change, we can make treatment recommendations. And then hopefully that entire group, that whole bee group supporting that apiary can look at that data and then use that information to make management decisions they want to see in the field. So I think this is really exciting. I think you're going to see this nationally in two years. I think this really could revolutionize our industry. And certainly so look out for that. OK, so the final slide that we're going to leave you with is just, a, again, another, another push for our website. I think you're going to find a lot of really good information. All the, all the management reports that we've talked about tonight are on there. All our other projects that we're working are on there, as well as if you want to sign up to take the management survey next year. You'll also find some really good, very informative, very unique blogs written by uh, some of our team members here that work in the lab, as well as our, our boots on the ground, our tech teams who are working across the nation. So I'd encourage you to go to the website if you can. Um, look through it. Let us know if you have any questions. We have contact information on our website, both phone calls and emails. Uh, so feel free to, to visit. Uh, we encourage you to do so. And, and we, enjoy, we enjoy hearing back from you. So thank you. Um, we, we have a lot of people to thank. The USDA certainly has, has given us a lot, but a lot of other organizations have been very supportive of our efforts. And of course, you, the beekeeper, have been supportive by participating and hopefully get benefit from it. I think that's the end of our talk. I don't know, um, um, Shane or Daniel, how we're going to, do we have questions that people type in, or how do we? Yes. Um, um, so I just wanted to point out that you know this has been uh, a world of information and a, a resource that you know, I, I will personally visit multiple times. Um, I just wanted to mention real quick that you know this webinar is recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube page and our Be Educated section. But I know that if you go and visit BeInformedPartnership. Um, sorry, BeInformed.org to to see the Be Informed Partnership. Um, you know, definitely read their blogs, uh, see the results, sign up for the survey. Um, but at this point in time, yes, the the floor is open for questions. So if any of the listening audience has questions, please post them now. Okay, uh, first one. Um, somebody is asking you to please explain the significance of the small pie chart of the participation ratio. Oh, so, sorry, let me go back to one of those. So this, so if you look at this technique not used in the purple, 68% of the respondents did not use the technique. And in the light blue, 32% of the respondents used the technique. OK. Um, somebody else, uh, treating for mites, uh, does that include organic methods, uh, such as the, the drone frames and dusting, or is it specific to chemicals? I, I guess they're referring back to the, the results of right. my treatment. Let me, let me go back up there. So in, 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 in our first, sorry. <laughs> so when we look at Varroa mite control product, 
by product use. We are only talking about products that we know have been approved for use in the United States or in the Western world. Like oxalic acid hasn't been approved, but it's used everywhere in the world. So we know it's a known varroa mite control product. We have not added in this graph people who use IPM techniques. But that's where the multifactorial analysis comes. Our guess would be that people who use IPM techniques plus a varroa mite control product are going to do better than people who just use a varroa mite control product. Okay. And I think you've already seen that the, the, the IPM technique of drone brood removal does work. At least it's indicated it's working in the north. Okay, this person writes in, I thought that pesticides were accumulating over time in the wax and comb. This is why we were asked to change 10% of our frames every year. What do you think? Well, I agree. Pesticides do accumulate in the wax. And when we do studies, there are certainly sometimes very alarming levels of pesticides in the wax. And we're about to publish soon publications that show after a certain threshold, they have really negative consequences. The 10% number, if you, I'm sorry, close your eyes as I flip down to that, that number. <laughs> um, if you look here, people who replaced 10% of their frame, basically one frame per brood box, lost just the same as people who didn't replace at all. And just, like I mean, it's still, it's still not significantly different because the more than 50% has a really large confidence interval. So it's not different from them, but it's approaching it. So I think 10% still is a safe guess. My point is, though, you can do too much of a good thing. You don't want to go to 50%. 10% still makes the same. You're still losing the same as if you didn't replace anything at all or um, other le levels. Yeah, and I think a lot, some of the products that were used in the past, like Kumafos, did accumulate in the wax. As a matter of fact, we see, we see it in wax from people who haven't used Kumafos in 10 or 20 years or from beekeepers who have never used Kumafos. But a lot of the products that are out there now do not accumulate in the wax, like like the older, older chemicals. And, and Kumafos, we're seeing um, a lot of the mites coming in are resistant to that anyway. OK. Um, another one here. If I have been involved in the survey process this year, do I have to renew for next year, or am I automatically enrolled? No, unfortunately, you're, you're in our listserv for the rest of your life. <laughs> no, if you, enrolled, if you enrolled in any previous years, and did not send us an email saying you wanted to be removed, you will be automatically um, informed, you know, in, in come April that the survey is live. So we thank those people who have, who have graciously given their, their emails. And, and you'll be contacted on a regular basis until, until you tell us to stop. And, and just to give everybody a quick reminder of how to sign up for that survey, um, do, do you mind going back to that slide that, to show the participation button? Sure. If you go to if you go to our, our home website, uh, beinformed.org, you'll see a button that says "Sign up to participate now." Let's see if we can find it on here. Uh, we should probably just call, bring up our website. Can we just bring up our website? I'll bring up the website. Yes, one second. Give us a minute. So if you come to our website, you'll see. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> well, that's not supposed to happen. Um, sign up to participate. Here, you can enter your well, that's, that's email blog. blog and then contact us. No, I think if you go. Right here. Oh yes, here. We've just redesigned it. So here, the participate, sign up to be part of this year's survey. So if you, so click, you click on, on that, that, then you can add your email address yep. and you can participate. Okay. Um, I've got another question back resorting to uh, comb and build up in the wax. Uh, what about amitraz uh, build up in wax? Yeah, so all the the hard chemicals, so Kumafos, Valinate, and Amitraz are lipophilic. That means that they like beeswax and they migrate there. And the, the advantage to that is that it doesn't migrate into liquid like honey. 
So we don't see a lot of contamination in honey. So that's good. Whereas we're worried about the buildup. Uh, one thing that I don't understand is we're not seeing amitraz or its derivatives build up as much as we have seen for fluvalinate or comophos. So something else is going on there. It either breaks down or it's not being held there as much. So we're just not seeing the levels that I would have thought we would see considering its use. Okay. And one final question here, and then, then we'll kind of wrap things up. Um, do you have any way of determining the percentage of U.S. beekeepers in each of your three group, particip group participated in the survey? That's an excellent question, and that's exactly when we do this multifactorial analysis. We will actually come up with best management practices for commercial beekeepers versus stationary versus small-scale beekeepers. So we plan to break that down by operation size. We really think that the best management practices for commercial beekeepers are very different than the best management practices for small-scale beekeepers. And so we plan to break that down. It's just we couldn't break it further down the north and south with having confidence that the results would mean very much. Now we have enough data, we can do that, and we're working on doing that right now. Did that, did, that, did that answer your question, Dana, or they were asking specifically what percentage of beekeepers are we reaching in each of the groups, like the commercial beekeepers? I think they were at, um, asking percentage of each group that yeah, participated. We, yeah, we, we don't have a good idea of how many backyard, boy, Brushy Mountain could help us with that, how many backyard <laughs> beekeepers there are sideliners, but we think we're reaching about 10% of the commercial beekeepers. So we do know that number pretty well. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time and, and you know, talking with us about BM Foreign Partnership and the, the great results that have come out of the National Management Survey. I just want to note real quick here that uh, we are still struggling with the honeybee health, and BIP is the leading resource that has given us real-time results. Uh, they are using results from day-to-day -day beekeepers and, and giving us reliable results. So for the listening audience, if you have not signed up for the result or for the survey, please go to beinformed.org. You can see the, the orange box there to, to sign up and participate. It's a great resource. It helps us out tremendously. And Dennis, Karen, thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel and Shane, and, and for, for our audience. Thank you. And that is the end of the webinar. Thank you, everybody.